stand up, find, find someone near them that they don't know, introduce themselves and smile at them. I know you do it, but I don't know. I said hello to you on Tuesday morning. Uh, my name's Andy Parker. I work for the SRM Governance Initiative and also for the next few weeks for the IASS. Um, first of all, a, a small apology for the setup of the seats. We hope to have a circular setup, um, not this sort of uh, parliamentary slash public execution setup that we have at the moment. Rather happily, someone's pointed out to me that maybe it's a wedding setup. This is a great bringing together of all, of all oh, these. Uh, that's, that's rather up to you guys in the next hour, so let's, let's see how it goes. So, um, Oliver, do you want to introduce what we're going to. So, what we're doing, let's say we're going to try and look at ourselves and discuss where we've come from and what we want to go on to do. Um, we're going to be aided by that, uh, in that, to some extent, by some prompting material, but mainly this is going to be about um, you answering questions about yourselves and what you think and what you want. In a sense, basically, this is an inversion. You are a very, very large panel. And Andy and I are a very small audience um, who will ask you questions and try and find out about you. Yes, yeah, so the moment you have something to say, whip your hands up, we will come to you with the roving microphones. There is an exception to that rule. Uh, at this point, I want to introduce Masa Sugiyama from the University of Tokyo. Um, some of you very kindly responded to the CEC survey earlier in the week. And Masa has very quickly crunched the numbers and has got some data uh, to show to us. We'll be taking questions about the survey data. Um, we would like your responses to stay on the subject matter. Their massive very much welcomes any questions that you have about the survey set up, about the wording of the questions. We contend that spending the next hour debating them will not be as fun as talking about climate engineering now and in the future. So if you've got any quibbles, uh, send them to Massa after the proceedings. Massa, do you want to get going with the slides? Show us what you found. So my name is Master Sugiyama. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. So, and first of all, thank you very much for all those who answered the survey, and uh, also all, all the people who helped me to create the survey. Um, so let's get to the meat of the stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like I, Andy said, these results are just a snapshot of, of all of you, and this is not a real scholarly uh, detail regarding academic analysis, uh, partly because I got the results of that yesterday, and uh, I'm presenting the results to you all today, so it's a quasi real time analysis. I hope uh, I, you will get something out of it. Uh, and uh, I really welcome any criticisms and, uh, and comments on the, how the survey was conducted and how the survey was framed. But, uh, but I think uh, please give us afterwards or an email. Uh, that would, I think we can spend this time uh, in a better way. So let's get to the, uh, the results. So let me quickly go through demographics of who you are, in a sense. Um, so this is the, the snapshot of the, the attend actually, not the attendance participants, rather actually uh, respondents. So uh, many people did not go to CEC 14, so they are uh, newcomers to this meeting. And uh, the, in terms of the age, they are, uh, the respondents are fairly young. Uh, the, the biggest chunk is 25 to 34. And uh, many people have been working for, uh, on climate engineering for less than five years. Um, we can compare what CEC 14 was like and what CEC 17 is like. So here's a, a one result from uh, the CEC 14 conference report. 
and uh, uh, three years ago we had uh, only four uh, percent coming from the NGO uh, nonprofit sector and uh, so what about this time around again this is about respondents but we have uh, more people from uh, the uh, nonprofit uh, sector uh, you know beyond the ten percent also we have uh, among the respondents we have more social analysts, social scientists and humanities scholars than natural science and engineering so Andy? Yeah. You notice the, um, is this on? Oh, good. Okay, go. Um, uh, in the survey for 2014, CC14, um, uh, there were fewer NGO representatives than we'd hoped for. There are more now, nearly 15%. So we were wondering if anyone here now uh, is from an NGO but didn't attend in 2014, wants to tell us what's changed, why they're now taking part in the discussion, why they weren't in 2014. Any volunteers? Difficult question to be the first volunteer. Would help. Moving on then. Well, <laughs> uh, I will come back because it is, this is a strange format and it's difficult, to, it's not necessarily comfortable, but there you go. Um, oh, I don't need to use that. <laughs> um, another interesting thing about this is that you will see that the social sciences and humanities um, are a large plurality. Um, could we have some hands from social sciences and humanities? Now, I wonder if um, any of you would care to address this question, um, which is, would any of you like to give an opinion on whether you think there are too few natural scientists and engineers yet? Less than a third of the respondents. Any of the human, humanities, social scientists on that? The question is, do you feel that there may be too few natural scientists? There's less than a third of this audience. It is, let us say, a view that has not, has sometimes been heard over beers. Um, yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Please. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I'm Jane Flakel. I'm a PhD student at Berkeley. I think we have to be more discerning about our categories. So um, I think that there are far too few engineers in the room, is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and biologists and ecologists. So, like, I think there are subcategories of these things. Yep. Well, you asked a simple question, and the simple answer is yes, there are too few natural scientists here. But. Um, in addition to what's been said, I also believe there are too few, but not necessarily as a share, but rather as a total number. So the conference should be able to grow in future years. So you just want a bigger conference. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to say, um, we're going to be putting out some statistics about who, actually who was here and I mean, I, I think that there probably are um, relatively few natural scientists, but I think you need to take into consideration uh, social scientists are much more likely to take part in a social <laughs> science survey mm. than natural scientists. <laughs> Yeah. Because they are so public. Yeah, direct that at Massa, not at us. <laughs> okay, um, Massa, move us on. <laughs> Okay, um, so more uh, demographics. Uh, so uh, this, time around, around, this time around, the CC17 it was stranded uh, around uh, between uh, you know SRMGI Global Forum, and uh, so last time we had uh, less than two percent of participants from the mid or low income economies, and this time uh, we have more than twenty percent of people coming from that region. So that is a difference between CC14 and uh, 17. And uh, in terms of gender, uh, the, the left panel shows uh, uh, the gender distribution in the, the conference of participants, and we had, I think, 38%. At least among the respondents, uh, we had less than 30%. So maybe we not be uh, doing as well as last time in terms of gender equality. But anyway, let's move on. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see, perceptions, <laughs> I, I actually don't quite understand, um, I'm, I'm a, being Japanese, I'm not good at you know, jokes in English, so bear, bear with me. <laughs> uh, perceptions, uh, so uh, the, the key difference between CC14 and the 17 is that we now have the Paris Agreement, and we now have the Paris goals, two degrees and a 1.5 degrees target, so how is it likely for us to achieve these two, go to, two goals, so, uh, these goals. So uh, people think it is very unlikely to achieve 1.5 degrees target, more than 60%, and uh, more than 40% of the people, uh, respondents, answer that it is unlikely for us to achieve one, uh, two degrees target. 
So, yes, yeah. questions. Well, first, first an observation, which I think is quite fun. Uh, looking down here, at very likely, we learned that at least one of you thinks it's very likely we'll hit 1.5 degrees, but not very likely we'll hit two. <laughs> now, 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 far be it from me to suggest that there are some social scientists who don't understand the numbers. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to ask you, anyone, anyone want to put, put their hand up on the following? Um, anyone who thinks that it's likely, because you can see the majority think that it's unlikely we're going to hit um, 1.5 or even 2 degrees. Someone who thinks it's either likely or very likely that we're going to stay under 2 degrees without needing any form of climate engineering, want to explain how they see the next uh, 80 years or so? Yeah, just an 80-year roadmap <laughs> in, in, in two pithy sentences. No takers on that. Move on to the next one then, Massa. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, I, I missed one thing in the Andy clarified, but that was question of under the condition of no deployment of the SRM or CDR. So in, in here we are asked, I, I asked the, about you know, timing of SRM deployment and the, the, the timing of net negative emissions. Uh, for net negative emissions, uh, uh, respondents believe that it is, uh, we get, it's going to, uh, it is likely to have them uh, beyond 2050, uh, uh, most, uh, for the large chunk is 2060 through 2079. And uh, opinions are divided for timing of SRM deployment. Uh, a number of people think it, the, it is likely for us to have SRM deployment before uh, 2059. And but, but some people believe that it, it's, it will never happen. So, Andy? Um, yes, so we can see on the left-hand column about one-fifth of you, about 20%, don't know when SRM will be deployed. Um, so for those who do know, uh, <laughs> um, who thinks that SRM, who, and is prepared to answer, who thinks that SRM will be deployed before 2030? Because there were several respondents in that category. Rafe, we have a taker. Thank you so much. <laughs> an opportunity. Uh, do I really believe this, or I just want a chance at the mic? Uh, uh, there's a good chance. Well, here's why. Because I think the situation, the climate situation, is changing dramatically, and the, uh, the actual impacts are growing very fast. So we really don't have an idea of how fast governments will react. You'd have to be a pessimist right now to think we'd ever or optimist that you'd see something before 2030. But I think the situation's in a rapid state of change. And Andrew. Yeah, I think in answering this question, it's important to realize it's not just a binary kind of global deployment or nothing. I think that you'll see a steadily, steady ramp up from people doing things like regional heat wave mitigation, hurricane disruption, and uh, some small scale entrepreneurship for voluntary carbon offsets before you'll see any kind of global deployment. And it's through establishing norms and, and testing technologies for those kind of applications that we're likely to see um, uh, a pathway formed to a sensible and safe deployment um, more globally. And since we noted that it was a kind of bimodal response, do we have a never person who'd like to give their position on never? Quite a lot of you. Yeah. So who's pointing at you Okay, I'm a woman, I'm allowed to speak first. Um, I think, <laughs> sorry, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic enough to think that we never deploy it um, because we come to the conclusion that it is uh, n not a good idea for a deployment when it's not in, the, in, a, in, a, in a governed uh, world where everyone agrees we should and I don't think we ever come there, so. Uh, I, I don't think that they will ever deploy it. Actually, I didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was more on the optimistic part that uh, if we actually move and um, act soon enough that uh, it's at least not very unlikely. I'm sure I didn't answer that. <laughs> I I don't think uh, the world can ever agree on where to set the planetary thermostat, and I think the, there are some risks that will never be able to be reduced enough, and people will consider it more risky than not doing it. 
So that's why I don't think it'll ever, ever be implemented. I wrote a paper on this five years ago saying that, and I haven't changed my mind. Okay, and I wanted to see, I want to go for uh, the high-risk strategy of going for um, one of the small groups. Um, people, could anyone put up their hand who answered in that, that SRM was most likely to be deployed in the second half of the century, so 2050 onwards. It's a, it's a dip in the bimodal. Yeah, there we are. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit, not only about why you said that, but why do you think people seem to have a soon or never approach here? Um, I think it's inevitable that it's going to happen in some way, shape, or form, um, and I suspect I come down on the truly pessimistic side that it's going to happen outside of the realm of an organized sort of government-sanctioned SRM program. I think, I guess I believe some rogue nation will do it whether we want them to or not. But I think it's going to be a while before that happens. Um, The second part of that question was... Why do you think that, that what we seem to see there is that there's a quite a strong it happens soon and quite a strong it happens never and not a very strong it happens after 50 or 60 years when people have got their heads. I think it reflects the, the sort of true optimists and the true pessimists and that somewhere in the middle is probably more like the reality but... Okay. Yeah, let's look at the same for CDR. We can see like a fair majority, I think, uh, think that, well, no, at least a slim majority, think it's going to be, we're going to go net negative emissions between 2060 and 2100, particularly 2060 to 2080. Anyone who uh, put themselves in those categories want to explain what they think is going to ha happen between now and 2060? There were boys sniggering at the back. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I put it that as my answer because I saw it in a graph. <laughs> so, nothing but the facts, eh? <laughs> 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 it's RCP 2.6. RCP 2.6, okay. <laughs> yeah. Chiseled into tablets. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Sure. Um, so, uh, we, I posed this question in order to keep global temperature increases well below 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees, do you think we should deploy SRM and or CDR? And uh, opinion, uh, these opinions differ between these two technologies. Many think CDR should be used. Many uh, honestly, you know, chose strongly agree with this, uh, this statement. On, on the other hand, uh, the opinions are divided for SRM, and uh, there are a number of people who are uh, answered strongly disagree or disagree with the statement that uh, we should use SRM. So, well, I think this is, a, I think this is an, an interesting one. I think I always find this about this community, compared to other communities which look at um, out there technologies, this isn't remarkably, though it may not always be portrayed as such or may not always be experienced as such, really um, rather cautious and reflective community. I can't think, I mean, if you went to a synthetic biology conference and asked people whether they thought synthetic biology was something that people should use, they would all say yes or to within, to within um, 5%. Are there any um, yes. <laughs> yes, and they're captured, I think. But I wanted many of like to talk about what it's like to be someone who thinks um, we should use SRM in a conference where most people discussing the subject don't. So, uh, I guess my main advocacy for the potential use of SRM would be um, to prevent the collapse of systems that we care about. So one system that's being looked at currently is the coral reef system, which is one of the most vulnerable at two degrees. And so we may decide that there are important systems for the Earth's functioning that we need to preserve and that we do management or, or we make decisions collectively against what it's like to lose those systems. I would say ice sheets would be another example. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Um, Massa, next slide then, please. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, we also asked the question about the different SRM experiments and uh, uh, one, the timing of uh, SRM feed, uh, process studies versus timing of SRM field test. And uh, uh, this was a bit surprising to me, but, but the, a lot of people think the, we should, uh, uh, it is likely for us to have SRM uh, process uh, studies. This is uh, just like the, there was a, has been a lot of discussion on Scopic. So this is uh, uh, expected, but, but, but that's true for also the field test in terms of the climate response test. So uh, many people think, so here again, uh, the response is uh, by, by, uh, by model. So a number of people think it, it's gonna never happen, but, but it's there are a substantial portion of people who think it will happen soon. And in terms of research, I posed another question. So I asked whether you agree or disagree uh, on the expansion of uh, different types of research. And across the different types of research, yes, we need more research. That's, that, that, that's the response. And that's true for both uh, SRM and CDR. So um, yes, we need more research. It's, it, apparently, that's the, uh, what respondents think. I just like to point out, we all thought this was quite remarkable that researchers called for strong support across all these. <laughs> <laughs> so I did uh, uh, some analysis uh, given in the minimum amount of time. I couldn't do much, but but yeah, I did it some, and uh, I found uh, uh, these uh, somewhat interesting. And um, so. This is a, a normal parametric uh, one-way ANOVA. Uh, so, but the, the point is that, uh, so here I'm sh contrasting uh, the high-income economy, those from high-income economies and uh, uh, middle low or low-income economies. And uh, the question here is showing the chance of uh, achieving 1.5 degree target. And uh, uh, they, those from, uh, uh, if you look at the, the, the pessimism among the uh, high-income High-income country uh, residents, uh, it's uh, uh, it's pretty quite high. Eighty percent of respondents said uh, it is very unlikely for us to achieve the 1.5 degree target without uh, uh, SRM uh, or CDR. So, but but there's some optimism, slightly more optimism uh, uh, for the middle, uh, for those from the mid or low-income economies. Well, but uh, did, but still, they think we should use SRM. So here again, it's a similar in the similar format. So it's contrasting uh, the high, those from high income economies and those from middle, uh, mid to low income economies. And uh, and uh, so we should, uh, you know, the question posed whether we should use SRM. And uh, a lot of uh, many people from the high income economies they strongly disagree or disagree with this uh, statement. But those from the middle income uh, economies, they uh, there is some tendency for them to agree. Or strongly agree. Yeah, and that's something we wanted to follow up on. Um, for any people who are from middle or low income countries, we wondered if you had any views on why we see this gap here in agree and strongly agree. Why does there seem to be more support for deployment of SRM from people in middle or low income countries? Anyone from a middle or low income country want to comment? Eduardo. Uh, I think uh, maybe because of the uh, the perception about the, the, the worsening of the climate crisis and the impacts uh, are stronger in low, middle, uh, low and middle income economies. And so for that reason, the idea of an alternative that com could be complementary uh, is much more uh, perceived as needed compared with if you are a more uh, high income, technologically developed uh, economy. Any other takers yeah. on that question? No, that would look great. Um, and I think, is that on the last slide? Yes, yeah. yeah, this yeah. is the last slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so then we have one of the few sort of like more general questions just to get a sense of um, the room and where people were. And one of them, that, and we asked various people what questions they were interested in asking the, uh, the audience. And one was, I think we all, I mean, Paris was the theme of the discussion we had at the House of World Culture, and it's mentioned in the plenary. That how <coughs> much and how deeply has Paris changed, particularly the way people think about CDR? So, anyone who wants to say anything about that? Oh, that's good.
Thank you very much. Um, so I think that uh, before Paris, uh, the expectation was that the target would be two degrees. And I think that uh, you could kid yourself that you could get to two degrees through mitigation alone. I mean, it's in the models, but people could, could kind of squeeze their mind around the, the fact that you could maybe do it. I think once the target is 1.5 degrees, I think it becomes inevitable that you either need negative emissions, time machine, or SRM. Um, so I think that has changed. I think that is uh, one of the key things that has changed since CC14. And did you pick up a feeling of that change here at 17? Did you, I mean, that's your analysis of Paris, but did you feel that the conference had a different feeling in the yeah. way it discussed these things? I, I've, I've talked to uh, a number of people, um, including people who you would think of as being mm -hmm. Uh, negatively disposed to carbon dioxide removal um, who have expressed that view to me that um, if you want to get to one and a half degrees you're going to need negative emissions and I don't think that that was in their frame previously. I'd agree with Tim entirely for policymakers, ones outside of this conference. For me personally and for many of the people that I've talked to here it hasn't changed my thinking about CDR a bit. Um, because I think what we need to focus on, from my perspective, is minimizing climate impacts. And whether that's 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees or whatever, the focus should be on reducing our emissions as far as possible and augmenting that with carbon dioxide removal as it becomes possible to do in whatever way as possible. And, uh, but I think, indeed, for the political framing, it may have changed quite a bit. But I'd be curious, uh, my, my sense from talking to a lot of people here is that, that hasn't had so much of an impact on them as people who have been dealing with this topic for a while. So on, on, uh, on Paris, also not just this, but also more generally, the question of having seen a large and um, within some ways at least successful climate negotiation, has that changed how people feel about this field or about their participation in this field at all, or change, change the mood of the conference? So, um, two things. I think with regard to the point Mark is making, I think uh, you're probably right about a large number of people. Um, however, I also observe a slight change in the sort of point of reference that we use to mean what level of warming do we actually consider, in parenthesis, safe. Um, and I do think that the reintroduction of 1.5 degrees as a sort of point of orientation has actually changed what the, the discussion about safe levels of warming. And again, I don't mean that in the literal sense, but in, in the discourse. Um, and I think it has raised awareness of climate impacts that are occurring uh, at levels of warming that are way lower than even two degrees. Um, that said, with regard to uh, policy discussions, I find uh, that there is, with Paris in place and with increasing, uh, hopefully increasing confidence in the, in the architecture of Paris uh, and its ability to deliver, hopefully increasingly ambitious mitigation, um, I think that has been viewed by some as a necessary precondition to even talk about SRM uh, in a public format. If this precondition wasn't met, uh, then I believe discussions, public discussions on SRM would be even more difficult than they already are. Thanks. Well, in my view, Paris was really a good news, bad news story. And both the good news and the bad news aspects are really salient for me. So, yes, it really did reflect in significant and important ways more progress than had it been achieved previously through 25 years of efforts. But the fact that Paris was characterized as a great success, I find itself terribly distressing when I compare the likely achievements out of it to the time scale and the, the gravity of the challenge and what is needed to limit climate change risk. So, you know, without meaning to disparage it more than is appropriate, because it really is movement, for me it was a shocking experience of seeing political success on mitigation against the scale of the problem. And that is the main reason that Paris has made me judge both CDR and SRM, both more likely to be deployed 
and likely to be on balance more desirable. Okay. Um, I guess um, as an international legal scholar, I would like to um, express some skepticism in terms of what that target actually means. Um, so objectives in um, conventions can have multiple purposes, and I think um, the, sort of the prevailing um, position in, in the legal literature is that it was an expression of aspiration or solidarity, but certainly not um, a target that mandates a certain course of action at all costs, and I think um, the idea of equity and poverty reduction and reduction of impacts um, certainly has to be taken into account when we pursue certain kinds of technological strategies. And Atik? I think the analysis given about Paris is absolutely right. It has been one of the greatest compromises to get everybody on the table. And there were a lot of dissenters and a lot of resentment across the system. And 1.5 came from the least developed countries who have already been feeling that all their efforts to get out of poverty and the rest was being un undermined by climate change impact or presumed climate change impacts or allocated climate change impacts. So that was there, but to keep that inside there was, this was the compromised diplomatic, grand diplomatic language as usual, 1.5. However, Paris itself is a framework and, you know, I call it a fisherman's net. Fisherman's net, it is lots of knots, knots with all holes inside. <laughs> so, it is a holy uh, agreement. However, to get the rich countries on board to commit something because they have not delivered their mitigation. All the discussion that we are doing so far is based on this one reality that the mitigation that was promised has not been delivered. So the failure of delivering mitigation enhances the need for adaptation. And the adaptation needs were immediately enhanced and it is quite visible and increasing. Everybody understands that even the poorest of the poor, we have worked with non-literate farmers, fishermen across the world, the same expression as something is wrong in our life, we don't know what. So that is understood and absence of adaptation creates a whole lot of loss and damage. And since there is no mechanism, and Kyoto, uh, sorry, Paris has structurally got out of any responsibility and liability of loss and damage, the resultant issue will be massive human displacement. And this massive human displacement will not be able, this is IPCC language, for AS4, AR4 is about 300 million people, let's call half of that, 150 million people displaced our nation states will not be able to handle that. So global destabilization will be a consequence of that. And anything, some people are realizing something has to be done, but it has to be mitigation first, before anything else starts. If mitigation is not done, and other supplementary system comes along, then all the oil lobby and coal lobby will be back, and they will be doing exactly what they were doing before, and we are back to square one. So we have to be very careful as to where we are going with this. I think there was a, a small but real step forward in level of commitment at Paris. Uh, but I think, from my mind, that's connected at least as much to changes in energy technology as to what the negotiators did. I think the extraordinary improvement in the cost of solar power, really, really stunning. Uh, uh, the, the gradual sense that battery vehicles might really take part of transportation infrastructure. I think there's a set of changes there that have, you know, I think, materially changed thinking about how quickly emissions can be cut, at least from my perspective, sort of been involved in, in energy stuff for uh, 30 years or so. I think it really feels a bit like an inflection point in terms of the ability to do that. Um, I think that the, it's certainly true that politically CDR is, in the, is talked about uh, and maybe arguably a little bit SRM, but I think it's, uh, there is black boxes. I think that, I, I predict that if CDR ever happens, uh, the 
a relationship between what we now think it will be and what it actually is will be pretty weak because uh, there's been almost no real research, almost no real understanding of the environmental consequences. My personal list of, if you asked me to list the things that seem to have the highest level of capacity and lowest environmental impact, there'd be little relationship between those and what currently is researched. Not that I'm necessarily right, but I think that, that, that they're just, they're just very thin. What happened was it got put on the, put on the, 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 the metric, but there just isn't much there there. Okay, we'll go to Christopher, then Eduardo, then we'll go to another question. Yeah, okay, um, just, 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 just to mark a question from, so I'm a political scientist and uh, working in the field of technology assessment, and we are also giving advice to parliaments, and um, I don't know if we have an orange-haired elephant in the room, so I think it's also important to look at the political developments in order to think about these questions. This is not only scientific or technological questions, so I don't know how much uh, in this community people are interested how the development of these different right-wing movements, which all have a clear agenda on climate change too, what they think about climate engineering stuff and what the gentleman said before, this is closely connected with displacement of people. And I think it's very important for all these considerations concerning what is possible to keep in mind uh, the political changes. So, so my question would basically be, is this community also looking at these kind of uh, uh, broader political questions, because I think they, they are game changers too. Agree, completely agreeing with Ted, I would add, add some bad news to the good news. That is, if we look in South America, at least in my region, to what has happened in the almost two years happening since Paris, the uh, the only two countries are com uh, looks committed to follow their what they promised in their national determining the contribution that are Chile and Uruguay, but they represent just six percent of the of the total emissions of South America. Okay, in, in the case of Brazil, for example, in the last three years we have increased around 60% our emissions coming from dramatic increase in deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, yeah, just a, cu a couple things on the significance of Paris, which I totally agree that the focus should be on the content of the commitments. But there's two other things that I think people should keep in mind that I would say are extremely important. The first one is, is that don't look at what happened in December of 2015. Look at what happened in the process that led up to it, the three or four years there. Climate change went from an issue which was, frankly, in the backwater of international relations. Um, you could get away. You could be a party out there, a country, and be, and, be, and be great on everything and be complete shit on climate change, and you would garner world respect, and you wouldn't suffer any consequences for that. That has changed. And if you want proof for, for the change, way earlier than we ever wanted it to be, it's now, Paris is now undergoing, undergoing its biggest stress test when the world's second largest emitter is now announced it intends to withdraw. Are they suffering consequences in terms of international relations? Absolutely. Look at how the United States was isolated at the G7. Look at how it was isolated here in Germany in the G20. For the first time in the history of a G20 statement, there's one paragraph that talks about what one country is going to do in a joint leader's declaration. That's never happened before because no other party, not any of the fossil rich countries around the world were willing to side with the United States on a pro-fossil statement in the climate paragraph. That means there's an opportunity and I think that's gonna continue. The second thing that was created in Paris is not just the one-off commitments that were made for the first cycle of pledges but the fact of setting up a cycle of pledges, setting up a process for doing a global assessment of what are the opportunities for each pledges going forward, which will partly look at things Dave was talking about. What are the market opportunities that are right there in front of you that you have not yet reached for and you should because it's in your self-interest? What that means for the, those in this community who want to encourage more research on climate engineering is you now have an opening, a secure place in the international agenda uh, at regular cycles to make sure that this gets looked at and that you can garner support for it. It's going to be a crowded field in terms of different people trying to get different uh, uh, technologies and pathways um, 
to get the attention of global leaders, but they're the ones, right, we have to appeal to, like it or not. And they are, do take these targets seriously, like it or not. And so this is where we can step in if we want to see research in these areas and make sure that they get more attention than they should. Thank you, Andrew. Um, switch to a different question. One of the things that has been tangibly different between CC14 and 17 in, in the panels, in the coffee breaks, in the conversations, is the presence of so many more people from low and middle income countries. So now SRMGI has worked to get people here, the ISS has worked with SRMGI, but mainly it's because a large number of people were prepared to fly for 24 hours to spend a week away from home to come and discuss this strange topic. So I want to turn to them for a moment and ask, what are you going to take away from CEC 17? What are you going to take back to your home countries in the global south? What do you want to do next? Actually, before you do that, I had raised up my hand. They will answer their second question. All right. Let me say this. Really, I think this has been a great meeting, great eye-opener. But climate change in some countries, particularly those in the tropics, sometimes <clears throat> are gauged by saying the glacier, the ice cap of Mount Kilimanjaro has actually reduced. Or the ice cap of Mount Kenya is reduced, is gone, not completely gone. They look at the higher levels, but the truth of the matter is this, that in country issues are so important on climate change that we even ignore them. If I told you today that the income of persons growing tea in East African region has gone down drastically because of the two degree, one degree variation, tea once needs a very cool climate. The temperature has gone up, where it is grown, is now again receding. So the quantity, quality grown has reduced. That is not noted. Diseases in various places have actually gone up due to, again, variations in the temperatures. Most importantly, and the worst part of it, is that many water sources, rivers, including even lakes, the water has actually receded. And there is major, you read it in the newspapers a bit, but I don't know whether you all get it, that the competition between man, human beings, and the wild game for water is so critical that you get fighting between wild game and the persons who actually want that water. I'm telling you this at this micro level. But when you think big, we simply talk Kilimanjaro, Kenya, glaciers. It's not the reality. The reality is down at the bottom, and those are ideas that we want actually to establish and go back to reclaiming the 10% forest cover that we have actually been talking about. So human beings have understood, we have all understood the effect of high rise in temperatures. Your second question, when I fly down tomorrow, Saturday morning, to the city of Nairobi, it's now pouring. There are five, in fact, there will be floods, I think. I'll start by saying this. <clears throat> Sorry. I've attended this meeting, heavy. Every person of this earth, 29 countries, I think, 30, they're about attended. And what I got is these additions, additions in scientific thinking on climate engineering. Then they ask, what do you mean on climate engineering? I shall start explaining. And it's at that point that I'll do a small write-up to actually explain what the importance of this meeting is and what the importance of climate engineering could mean to a third developing nation like Kenya. Thank you. I'm Ruth Patop Singh from Jamaica. And if I can speak for small island developing states, what I'll take back from this conference is a lot of new information. Our countries will continue to do our mitigation and our adaptation. And we have now seen the, the need for this disruptive technologies in the form of SRM and CDR. 
but I'm not confident in saying to my government or to my colleagues that we are at a stage that we can say that this is, there are definite um, breakthroughs in these technologies. So what we want to do is to continue in a dialogue and I hope that out of this um, conference and out of the relationships we have with the IASS, that we will have some sort of platform to continue the dialogue and to ensure that we get the whole area of climate engineering in the dialogue, in the conversation of our political directorate. From a small island state, we have the opportunity in every small country, you have the same people in the same circles. We are the ones in Paris, we are the ones doing um, risk analysis and management. So I think we have a good opportunity to bring the message to our leaders and to the wider community. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Liz. <coughs> I promise you that we did not plan this small island developing states tag team, it just happened. I, I really want to make two points. I want to thank the speaker over there who uh, spoke so well to the fact that Paris was a success because you were able to bring 193 member states together with very divergent opinions from the United States to China, the G77 and China grouping, uh, the, the oil producing countries, countries with entirely disparate interests and get them to consensus. And whenever happens, that happens in the, the UN system, we pat ourselves on the back, we celebrate like crazy and we say, they're well done because if in a family it is difficult to get five people to agree on, on a direction to take if you're going on a trip in a car. Furthermore, if you get 193 member states together with the hundreds of negotiators that are in the room. Uh, so that is why we're congratulating ourselves over Paris to, to the person who asked the question and agreeing entirely with the, with the person who sought uh, to give an explanation. In relation to the question, how do we go forward? What are the next steps? As I indicated uh, during my comments uh, on the panel two days ago, I see things in two ways. I see things as a national policy maker, and I see things from the perspective of having worked as Assistant Secretary General of the UN, so I see that the global policy perspective. This gathering is fine, but if you look at it, it is primarily white, primarily male, primarily developed country. And it may not be politically correct to say that, but it's true. The, those most impacted and, and who have to make the decisions on this and the largest groupings within the UN negotiating system are developing countries, however those countries are constituted, whether they're Asian, whether they're Latin American, whether they're African, or whether they're SIDS. And therefore, the dialogue has to be broadened and to become more inclusive over those who are in the majority, in the number, so that when the discussion reaches the international fora, that they are informed and are able, therefore, to make decisions and contributions that that makes sense and that ultimately result in a beneficial outcome. I would wish to suggest that insofar as the originators of these processes and this discussion want to carry it to the next level, that you really need to have a conversation with climate negotiators. They are the people who need to understand what this is about. They're going to be the ones in the room saying yay yeah or nay, determining what paragraphs go in, which commas come out in the negotiation process for those who are, of you who are familiar <laughs> with it. I mean, people literally argue and come uh, to, to high and low words over whether a comma should stay in a negotiating paragraph or whether it should come out. And if the negotiation process is that intense, when you're throwing in something that is likely to be highly controversial and divisive, there has to be dialogue on the process from the very early stages. 
this is a very academic gathering, really good group. I've enjoyed the meeting immensely, but you need to be looking at who your target audiences are, who are the decision makers in the process, and I would therefore suggest let us go now to the climate change negotiators and broaden the conversation to them, and let us move it from there into the policy makers, because Paris was successful because the policy makers, the, uh, meaning the politicians, came early and said, yes, we have a, a perspective on this. Our perspective is X, Y, or Z, and we are going with an agreement, a consensus agreement. And if you want to get a consensus agreement on something that is going to be highly difficult, then you have to start a dialogue with policymakers very early so that when they get to the table, they understand the issues and this issue in particular. I've spoken longer than I intended, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Right. Thank you very much. Um, the last little bit um, is utterly self-reflective. Um, we don't know, um, for various reasons, whether there will be a CEC 20, um, but we would like to know if there were to be a CEC 20, what should it be like? Now, there's a, there's a formalism in the design school at Stanford that when you're offering critique, you say, I like, and then you say, I wish. I like that shirt. I do wish you wouldn't wear it. That sort of thing. Um, so feel free to use that extremely generous and West Coast form um, of critique, but, if you just, but also tell us what you didn't like about this conference and what you would like um, if we were to be able to do a CEC 20. Alan. I like this, I like this conference a, a lot, and uh, it wasn't quite as much fun as the last one because there were, wasn't as much controversy. But uh, there's still time, Alan. So, so I have a, I have a Berlin manifesto I'd like to no. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wish there were more government people here. The 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 number was very small, and I'd like to engage more people from government here to to uh, talk to the scientists, interact with us, because it seems like we're sort of talking to ourselves, and I'm not sure how much influence we would have on policy without them. I know they're busy, but. Uh, that was a terrific conference. I really learned a lot. I continue to be frustrated with parallel sessions which are, where I want to go to all of them. So, um, you know, minimizing that. I, I, I like Alan's suggestion and I like Liz's suggestion. Um, I also found that a lot of the sessions we were having the same speakers over and over again. And I really think you should avoid that and take Liz's suggestion to bring in um, Policymakers, negotiators, we have to suck them in somehow, and um, this might be a good way. But why do we have to wait till 2020? It might, you know, be better to find a way to do it earlier. I very much like that we've had a richer and more considered dialogue between the um, the scientists generally and the NGOs in this, and indeed the participants from low and medium income countries. I wish that we will not continue with the trend of normalizing the consideration of climate engineering. We need to remember it is controversial. We should debate it openly with in agonistic ways and we should not let it just become another option. If we do, then it will substitute for mitigation and we will all suffer as a result. Prakash. Uh, I like the fact that there were some uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary panels. Um, and I hope this continues and there are many more multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary panels in the next conference whenever it happens. Secondly, uh, it's been suggested that we need government people. I would say we also need subnational and local government people in here. That would be great as well. And Andrew. Yeah, just a really quick point. I mean, I think that the um, Wallace is very useful. The big loss for me for this conference compared to 
the previous one was it wasn't held in a hotel that everyone was staying at because the number of chance meetings that I've had with people and the opportunities to get to know people I didn't know previously has been like a tenth of what it has been from previous years. So, you know, real loss, I think. Uh, yep. Sorry, I, I'm not sure you can see me, so I'm going to stand. Um, I like uh, the discussions in this forum. I am quite happy uh, to have actually been invited, and uh, thank you, everyone, for whichever contribution. Um, I think that um, uh, it would be good moving forward that in addition to um, the discussions we've had, especially for um, those of us coming from developed nations and uh, small island countries, that we uh, form uh, country teams with the help of the already um, formed platform, the decimals, uh, SRMGI, um, so that uh, we can be able to at least um, have useful discussions. I believe that uh, we were a mix of uh, policy, um, governance, and uh, academia. So maybe if we were to form country teams, it would uh, make sense to have at least one platform of engagement within countries uh, where we can then be able to reach as far as we wish um, across the board for other stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. You know, yeah. Yeah, uh, I learned a lot from this conference, and I just hope that in the next conference, uh, CEC 20, uh, we'll have uh, discussions also, opportunities for discussions on the regional impacts, as well as also sectoral impacts, particularly ag agriculture, uh, hydrology, and so on. Thank you. And I just have a very short suggestion for um, three years later, CEC 20, if the organizing committee are able to provide simultaneous interpretation service, we will get more people from local level on board. Thank you. Okay. As a climate negotiator, I did enjoy this uh, conference a lot. I enjoyed the variety of formats. I found it very enriching. I came with a number of questions, and I return with a lot more questions. But thank you very much. <laughs> a very good negotiator. So we've got, I, I, I think, <laughs> Shin and then Tim. Yeah. Um, the situation here is reminding me, because I've been engaged in climate change right from the beginning with Rafe, I think, is the only one here. Um, uh, 1988, 89, when climate change, the world was just around. Definition was being sought. Solutions were not known. The word adaptation was not discovered at that time. You know, and all the scientists said, you know, we will take the GAG out, problem will be solved, QED. Many of the negotiators of Rich countries said, what's the problem? Well, it will just disappear, JG will go. And we said, there will be human impacts. So what does human being come into this? These are gaseous things we are talking about. Very soon the world changed. Here also I think we are at that stage where we are talking now of numbers, processes, experiments. Those experiments are going to have impacts. Those impacts will be on agriculture, will be on fisheries, will be on forestry, will be on communities. Probably, I'm not sure whether the difference is there, but in climate change we are talking about where the nation state boundaries were well known, and that is where we thought things were operating. Here, we'll go up in the stratosphere, and nobody knows who owns that, and whose territory we are in, and whose impact we are trying to reduce. So there will be issues that needs to be resolved in a very serious way. But I'm a scientist, I'm an NGO, I advise the government at the highest level, so most of the major you know, policies of climate in Bangladesh have been one of the authors, so I don't know whether I'm government, non-government, anti-government, depending on which government. <laughs> so, you know, in that sort of scenario, we have to. This has been very good learning site for me. The reason I've come here is a lot of NGOs across the world have been telling me, please go and understand what is going on in this. What is the future hold? Are we getting into some deeper trouble? 
what they heard. So I've learned a lot. I've clarified a lot of my views. As, I, as it has rightly been said, many, many more complex questions. So I think next round in 2020, we should design in a way so that some of these sharp questions can be a bit more focused and answered, or at least attempt may be made, give the alternative answers. You know, I totally agree that we need to talk to the governments and more governments, but do not please take it to the Paris negotiation table. We are not yet ready. We do not understand ourselves in this room what we are doing. So let's get some clarity, then go there. Because with this ambiguity and uh, clearly demonstrated lack of confidence of what you're talking about, uh, I would rather get it a bit more sharper before I, we went to the negotiators. On the other hand, we cannot wait too long. If we wait too long, we'll be superseded. My last request would be for all the scientists, politicians, analysts involved, please do not think climate engineering is, an alternate, is a replacement for mitigation. It is the mitigation that must be done. Climate engineering can only supplement it. Anything otherwise, I think this group will be discarded in the history of a uh, dustbin of history. So please, this is my caution to all of them, supplement mitigation. Well, um, I really like the, the free food and excellent morning <laughs> coffee. And particularly, the, you know, everybody, every, every time you go to the conference, there's no morning free coffee. But this time, every day, we enjoy the free <laughs> morning coffee. That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and if there is, like, CEC 20, well, I love it, want to, don't want to attend it, that I want to enjoy the, I mean, attending, I'm mean, watching the Tokyo Olympic game 2020, so I hope I want to enjoy that. But, but seriously, well, I really like the, the conversations in taking place here, and even if you advocate the SIM or CDL, people taking very, very cautiously, people never, like, you know, enthusiastically supporting, and people don't want to, love, um, even like David, I mean, he, you are taken very carefully and then cautiously. I really like this kind of like, you know, very reflexive and, and taking cautiously and, and, and try to listen to the, the different opinions. And I really wish continue kind of, this kind of atmosphere uh, will continue in 2020. But also I want, I think we should not forget about, we are the very, very small community of people. Once we get out of this conference venue, I, people are walking on the street, they don't know about what we are talking about. So we should not pretend we represent the most, most of people in the world. Most of people don't know about this idea, what we are talking about. So I think we should be cautious to be, we are the very, very minor people and talking about a crazy idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim? I like Berlin. Um, and uh, I very much like the way this conference has been organized by ISS. I wish that in 2020, uh, the conference uh, takes place not in Berlin, but outside of Europe or North America, but it's still organized by the ISS. <laughs> Me? Uh, I, th I mean, at least from my point of view that I have participated in 2014 and, and this one, it, seem, it seems that in order to, to issue, to become much more concrete, we need that at the core of the next conference the, uh, to have the, the issue of the local and regional impacts. It's to say, as far as we are dealing with global, uh, um, global uh, solar engineering, without thinking in the impacts, uh, we, are street, uh, we are still in a very abstract world. In order to, have, to be more concrete and to, to, to engage much more informed uh, uh, opinions and, uh, and people uh, about what is really uh, climate engineering, we need uh, an advance in, in modeling. I don't know if this is possible. In, maybe David could answer or Alan how much you can 
advance until 2020 in, in, in modeling local and regional impacts and in order to, to, to the issue to become much more concrete. I have very small, very short likes, two really. First, let me thank the organizers for the very nice program you put up. And in particular, the opening ceremony by the great speakers from Jamaica, really. They gave an insight of their island and the headaches going on there that I thought was great. However, it would have been ideal in the course of this meeting, at some point, to really have had the status of climate change in the developing nations, covering Southern America, the Asia, continental Africa. There was perhaps no mention about the continent of Africa in the whole course, in the whole sitting that we actually had here. I waited in vain, and I would have loved to hear what actually goes on. We were from there, and perhaps next time, request for uh, the status of that continent on papers. Even if it may not be quite uniform, it was a nice meeting. Otherwise, for me, enjoyed the meeting, met my colleagues from my alma mater, Rutgers, and I thank you for having been here. I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, for the next conference, wherever that will be, in Berlin or elsewhere, I would like to see a lot of sky presentation and perhaps offsetting the remaining emissions caused by the conference. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. We've heard that people have liked Berlin, they've liked the venue. They've liked uh, the coffee. They've liked the coffee. They yeah. Didn't like my shirt, was that specific? No, 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 that wasn't your shirt. I think your shirt's lovely. Well, what, mm, very kind of you to point it out. Um, what they wished for is to hear perhaps less from uh, white male scientists. And for the final word on the conference, I turn to Mark Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to commit a sin and call another white male scientist up to the stage with me, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, come on up here. Let's together. <laughs> so as we draw this CEC 17 to a close, um, as was just done a moment ago, I'd like to take us back to the opening where we had the context set of bringing the background into the foreground with a wonderful set of keynote talks, reminding us that many societies and ecosystems are already being challenged by climate-related related phenomena, and that these challenges are likely to worsen substantially in the future as the climate continues to change. And they helped us to put these into an even broader context, into the context of sustainable development and uh, within the sustainable development goals, and to remind us that this connects to broadly to issues like livelihoods and human dignity. So at the conference, we've taken a good step forward towards a better common understanding of the potentials and the risks of carbon dioxide removal and of radiative forcing geoengineering techniques and the roles, if any, that they might end up playing in alleviating the impacts of climate change. Based on what I've been hearing from you so far, it seems like the CEC 17 has been quite successful in the three goals that we set out. It seems that it's provided a thorough and timely update on the latest developments in the field. It's provided a forum, especially making use of creative session formats for developing the synergies between the academic policy and the civic stakeholders. And finally, it's helped leads to a better understanding of how diverse groups think about and engage with the subject, as well as to a better understanding and a greater respect of each other. Now, of course, this all couldn't have been done and couldn't have been so successful without the support of many people and without the active feedback from you, not only in this final session, but throughout the conference and actually in the years since the last of these conferences. And I'm going to hand it over to Stefan, who's going to tell us a little bit more about both of those points. Okay, well, before I get to... Is this microphone working? Yes. 
Yeah? Okay. Good. So uh, before I get to the thank yous, uh, you were all very polite indeed in providing us with feedback on this conference and suggestions for the next conference. But I'd still like you to ask to uh, take advantage of the anonymity of the internet and uh, provide us with your real thoughts uh, in the online feedback form that we have uh, available there. And uh, don't hold back because that's what helps us uh, improve events that we hold in the future. Uh, so then I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, the many people that were involved in uh, preparing and developing and carrying out this conference, beginning with the organizers of this plenary session uh, that we all just enjoyed, then the keynote speakers from our opening event on Monday night, the panelists from our public evening event on Tuesday night, all of the session conveners for organizing a wide variety of sessions uh, that often followed the engaging and interactive formats that the steering committee had suggested, uh, crucially, of course, the CEC 17 Steering Committee for coming out to Potsdam twice in the run-up to the conference, uh, for preparing the conference, and for being continuously engaged and developing the conference program and, and uh, the many events that we had. And, uh, of course, the CEC 17 Advisory Group members for giving us feedback on all of that and providing us uh, with their own ideas and suggestions. Uh, and then from within this group particularly, I'd like to thank Oliver Morton, uh, who's done a fantastic job as always as a keynote speaker on Monday and as a moderator for our Tuesday night plenary and for many of the other events uh, that would have been neither as entertaining nor as intelligent without him. Uh, I'd like to thank our conference partners, uh, the SRMGI, the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, for helping us bring in such a diverse group uh, of participants, the House of World Cultures, House of Kultur und der Welt, HKV, for hosting our public evening event on Tuesday and the Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, C2G2, for facilitating the participation of colleagues from the policy world and for hosting the speaker's dinner last night. Now getting somewhat closer to home, I'd like to thank the IASS Events Management Department for coordinating the logistics of the conference, the IASS Press and Communications team for bringing in a range of media representatives, our student assistants for their support throughout, uh, then the IASS and its directorate, and of course, in particular, Mark Lawrence, uh, for uh, their support throughout the years. And then finally, and this is, uh, I'll easily admit, the most important point for me, I'd like to thank my colleague Miranda Butcher, without whom none of this would have been possible. And thank you, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so that was for everyone else. That was for everyone else, and we'll have the applause for Miranda separate when I'm done. So, um, whatever would have happened, if anything would have happened at all, certainly wouldn't have been as, uh, uh, as successful an event and as pleasant in the collaboration as it has been for me and for everyone else who's been involved at the ISS, and I'm sure for all of you as well who've been in contact with Miranda for the last past months. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for that, but I'd also uh, like to mention that as many of you here will know, but perhaps not all, uh, Miranda is also pursuing her own academic career, and you've just presented your excellent work at the Code of Conduct session uh, immediately before this plenary, and you'll be going on to take the next step in this career, uh, starting your PhD with us at the ISS, which we're all extremely happy about, and we wish you all the best for. So, now you may applaud. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to you all. Um, it's been a very stressful week, but it, <laughs> it's also been a real privilege and like a, a real pleasure to have interacted with so many of you uh, on so many different topics, whether it was where's the bathroom or uh, something more substantive. So thank you, thank you very much. Well, you'll all notice there's one more thank you that we forgot. <laughs> or that it wasn't in place yet, which is to Stefan Schaefer. Stefan has been the chair of the science, uh, the scientific committee, the steering committee for the uh, CEC 14 and now for the CEC 17, and has put, I'm not sure if he's put blood into this yet, but sure he put a heck of a lot of sweat and I think a few tears here and there <laughs> into organizing these conferences. And uh, I think a tremendous round of applause and thanks goes to him as well. <laughs>
And since Stefan has used up all of his energy over the last week, um, and perhaps he can share a few of these with Miranda, we have some organic truffles <laughs> to get him back on track. So, very good. And there's one more thanks that I'd like to say. Put this back here, which is, of course, a thanks to all of you. Um, it's been tremendous getting to know many of you, getting to see many of you again. Uh, the, the discussions have been very enriching, sometimes very challenging, very puzzling, uh, really bringing us forward in many ways, and I've really appreciated that, and I think this conference would have been a lot lonelier without all of you here, so <laughs> I think you should all give yourselves a round of applause as well. <laughs> So then finally comes the, when will we see each other again? Um, I hope to see all of you in many contexts, uh, perhaps earlier than a potential CEC 20. I really appreciate the feedback about the possibilities of a future climate engineering conference. Um, given the degree of interest, I was going to say there's sort of three conditions to being able to do a CEC 20. One of them is enough interest from the community. The, that's probably there. The second one is um, that we can get together good partners, as we've done the last couple of times. It's been very important. The third one is that we can scrounge up enough funding, um, which might be the biggest challenge, especially if we're supposed to do it on somewhere like Fiji. Um, <laughs> I definitely like Tim's idea of that, but I think uh, our funders would have quite a bit of trouble sending us all out there, so, but we will, we'll see what's possible. And so please, please do fill out the survey, give us your feedback. We will be talking with partners. Um, we, we, have, we will definitely entertain the possibility of still being organizing a CEC elsewhere besides Berlin. We'll entertain the possibility of doing that here. We need to talk with the organizers of the next Gordon Research Conference and make sure that there's not going to be a clash and overlap with that. It seems like it actually worked out okay this year. We were very worried about it, but maybe it's good that they be back to back. We can do a feed forward. We need to, to digest a lot of that. And so please do give your feedback. It will help us a lot, especially once we've got that feedback. We can go to various potential funders, including our own funders, and see if we can use that as an indication for, or as an, as an incentive for being able to put together the funding for doing a conference like this, and even better, I think somebody had mentioned we need to grow in numbers total, uh, see if we can do that. In the meantime, I'd like to wish you all well. I respect the work that you're doing in so many different ways. It has been wonderful to be learning about it. I think you all have your hearts in the right places. And I hope that we can really make use of what we've learned here to all move a step forward faster in supporting us towards a more wonderful world in the future. Thank you all, and all the best to you.